Hello, I'm Fantastic and Fantastic, and today I'm going to be talking about the Full Metal Alchemist Club that is returning to North America on Monday, December 3rd. So the Full Metal Alchemist Club has come to us one time in the past, and it gave us the debut of Edward, who at the time was probably the strongest leader in the game. That is because he combined a high multiplier, high personal damage, as well as an amazing damage reduction shield. Unfortunately, over time, better things have come out, and Edward has slowly declined. But with the return of the Full Metal Alchemist collab, all of the cards actually received the ability to be limit broken and thus super awoken, but the six star cards all foresaw major and significant buffs to themselves, as well as being able to be converted into a weapon assist form. So Edward is naturally one of the six star cards, and he received a heavy buff to his leader skill, and he gained the ability to gain a third seven combo super awakening. So he is significantly more powerful than before. He's kind of at the point now where he is top tier once again. So if you are interested in monster exchanging for a top tier leader, Edward is going to be a very solid choice, assuming you can make a team for him. But in that same breath, Edward's team building is quite gentle. So he is a great card to keep in mind. Now, the Machine overall has a 10% rolling rate for any of the diamond eggs. And in all honesty, all of them are valuable. So it's not as bad of a collab as it was the first time around where Edward was kind of the only really good card to actually roll. Now at least the other six star cards are much more meaningful. And then Scar received quite a significant buff as well as Reza Hawkeye. So it's a reasonable collab overall, but of course utilizing the monster exchange system may be one of the best ways to approach this event. So, all the cards in the Full Metal Alchemist collab can be limit broken, and cards that can be limit broken will have their level text displayed in blue. And if they are in blue and level max, you feed them a super snow globe, they will push to a level 100 and beyond. So that's the way to unlock limit break. And then once they have been limit broken, which means at level 100 or more, they can receive super awakenings. You can read more about super awakenings through my link on my website there. So. Weapon assist. So all of the six star cards in the Full Metal Alchemist Club kind of receive the Magic the Gathering treatment in that they all have the ability to be converted into a weapon assist form. So this type of evolution is a permanent choice. Once you go through with it, you cannot reverse it. But in that same breath, you are at least for the duration of the event allowed to monster exchange the weapon back into the base form. But doing so will lose all their pluses, skill ups, awakenings, levels, so on and so forth. They're just reset to the most basic form possible. So I would honestly never convert anything to a weapon unless I'm 100% sure this is exactly what I want to do. So. Weapon assist cards always have this special type of awakening present to indicate that when they are inherited onto another card, they will transfer over a sp specific set of additional awakenings. So you have the ability to inherit the active skill, stats if applicable, and awakenings at the same time. So it's very powerful, and some of the cards in this event are definitely worth converting into their weapon assist form. So the first card in the event and the kind of star of the show, so to speak, is Edward. So Edward's active changes hearts and hazards, so jammers and poisons, into light orbs and full health recovery. So you don't need those heart orbs anymore because you're healed to full health. And then you get light attribute attack three times for one turn. It's on a 20 turn cooldown, so this is quite lengthy, but thankfully, he has the skill charge awakening. And with the skill charge awakening, he's able to give himself one turn personal haste every time you match rainbow colors. So you match all five colors of red, blue, green, light, and dark, you can get a personal turn of haste. So his active can in theory be a 10 turn cooldown, which is quite powerful for how much it actually does provide. His leader skill has now been buffed to the point where he gives 196 times attack and 57.75% damage reduction when you're above 50% health and hitting six or more combos. So that's a wonderfully high attack multiplier. It's got a huge damage reduction component and he has the ability to gain a third seven combo super awakening to propel his own personal damage to even higher levels. And this is why he's such a strong leader because when you pair double Edwards, you're having double triple seven, you're having two triple seven combo cards as leaders. You're hitting for amazingly high amounts of damage and this is quite powerful overall. In terms of his weapon assist form, his weapon assist form is definitely best on himself. It has very little applications beyond that, and you should never, ever, ever convert your Edward into weapon assist unless he is a duplicate and you inherit it onto himself. That's where it is most powerful and beneficial. Otherwise, it is not worth it. But as a weapon assist, he gives team HP, which is 
an incredibly powerful stat for Edward teams, flat health and attack when above 80% health. So everything you really want on Edward is in his weapon assist. So in terms of his team building, all he can use any card he actually wants to, which is quite special. Like unlike use cases restricted to light based cards, either light main or sub attribute, Edward can use anything just to better um, counter the dungeon at hand. And that is significant. Of course, you still want to be as light based as possible to abuse Edward's base active skill. But the thing is, you can throw in something like knees if you need a large chunk of health and you're not necessarily penalized as much as you would be otherwise. And he does have more movement time compared to Yusuke. So Edward has two time extends. Yusuke has one, so that means dual leaders, Edward has one more second of orb movement time. It may sound a little trivial, but it can be meaningful under the right circumstances. Like if your team is lacking things like Yuna or Tachibanas or things of high amounts of time extends, it can make a significant difference when you have that extra second of orb movement time. <coughs> it means you don't have to use like the time extended badge, you can use health, which is what you should be using for Edward, because the most important stat for him in team building is health, because the bigger your health pool is, the larger your 50% margin is to stay above and when you stay above it you have the damage and the huge damage reduction shield. So the damage reduction shield is 57.75% and that occurs when you're above 50% health. So this occurs after you match orbs and heal. So let's say you drop below 50%, you match your orbs, you connected heal orbs and you heal all the way up. You will actually be above 50% when the enemy actually attacks you. So that means you actually are able to benefit from your damage reduction shield. You do not receive the attack multiplier because the attack multiplier only takes into account when you are above 50% health before matching. So that's the key distinct difference. You can always have your shield as long as you heal up, but you only get the attack multiplier when you are above 50% before you actually start moving orbs. So that is why Edward is so powerful because his effective health pool is quite large. And when you play in co-op mode, you should have enough health to actually tank all the preemptives in alt arena without the need to actually use a damage reduction shield, which can save your life in many different ways because let's say you forget on the floor before going on to actually shield, well, it's okay, you can tank the hit anyway. So that does make a big difference. And the thing is, shielding and damage reduction is more potent than flat HP when you have the equivalent amount of health. So for example, let's make math easy. You have a 50% damage reduction shield versus two times health. Both provide you the same amount of effective health of basically two times, but if you are to be hit by gravities, the damage reduction is more powerful, especially when the gravities are 100% or a bit more than 100%. No matter how much health you have and you get hit by 100% gravity, you are going to die. But if you have a damage reduction shield, you survive the hit, which makes a big difference. So that can have certain meanings through various content. But let's say you're facing like Gaia, um, her fully evolved form, which is like 300% gravity. You have Edward shield, you pop another shield, you can tank the hit. Like it's just things that you couldn't do with a flat health leader. It's just more options. But of course, the effective health from Edward's 57.75% is not as strong as a dual leaders of two times, so four times health. Four times health is still more effective health overall. So as already mentioned, health is the most important stat to consider for Edward teams. And also you wanna ensure that you have at least full rainbow color coverage. And that can occur if you use sub attributes. So for instance, ideal is light primary and then dark sub attributes. So this is not an exhaustive list, but it's kind of just a starting point of what to think about. You wanna have full color coverage, you want seven combos and ideally be light based. So ideal, the Cottons, Odin Dragon, Yusuke, Tachibana, Yuna, Amitsu, Lightning, and Knees are just some of the more prominent cards that I can think of off the top of my head. You'll have full color coverage if you mix and match them accordingly and you'll be on your happy little way. Finally, his weapon assist form, like I already mentioned before, should never be made unless you have a duplicate Edward and you basically just inherit it on top of himself because it's basically one of the best inherits for him possible because you get the bonus health, personal health, team health, as well as more damage when above 80%. So is Edward worth monster exchanging for? I would say yes, assuming you have a reasonable team to build with him and you don't have other high value leaders already. Like if you already own use Kate, the need to have Edward is diminished. Like Edward in theory can clear more content. It's a little easier to play with at the same time. But the thing is you're only gaining a 
bit more advantage. And the thing is, what if the YYH collab comes back where Yusuke is from, and then he receives something similar, and he becomes even more powerful overall? Like, that's probably going to happen at some point in the future. So the need to acquire Edward if you have Yusuke is definitely diminished. But let's say you didn't have Yusuke. You don't have, like, Dark Manitron or Barbara Julie. Edward is probably going to be one of the best options for you to actually have, and it'll probably be the strongest lead you will have for quite a long period of time. Next is Alphonse, and Alphonse is still reasonably strong overall, but the problem is he's kind of like a bit of a jack of all trades. He does a bit of everything, but he doesn't excel at any one particular aspect. His active skill is a full rainbow board changer, so like Dark Cali, so 5 colors plus hearts, and then 50% damage reduction shield. It can be reasonable, it gets you out of sticky situations in several different ways, but it's not incredible, it's not amazing, but it's still reasonable overall. His leader skill is actually not bad. It's 225 times attack for light attribute cards when you hit four or more colors. So not bad, Like, but Edward is a better leader. So he's a reasonable leader, just not as amazing. His awakenings are all right as well. He's got follow-up attack, full bind immunity, one seven combo, gets a second seven combo through super awakening. So he's kind of like Cotton, before Cotton gains her third seven combo through super awakening. So that is a bit of a drawback. Like Alphonse is kind of good at everything, but he's not amazing. Cotton just happens to be better in most cases overall. So Cotton also has higher weighted stats. Blue Cotton will have more health. Like it's just not going to be as ideal overall to use Alphonse. But again, if you are lacking options, Alphonse is definitely going to be a good all around card to have on your team. He does a bit of everything, but the problem is because he doesn't excel, he's not as wonderful because at this point in time in the game, we tend to like cards that are specialized and excel in some certain way because we can always build around their shortcomings with other subs that excel in a different aspect. His weapon assist form is all right. It's got three dark resists, which can be annoying. Like it is useful to have, but the thing is there is a Monster Hunter card that can provide this in their weapon assist form, but we don't know when Monster Hunter will come back. But in that same breath, Alphonse does provide Team RCV, so it's a little bit stronger overall. But the thing is, blind attacks are annoying, but you have ways to counter them a little more easily. And the blind attack usually only happens once, and then you can do something and deal with it. So you could either bring other, you can maybe use the Monster Hunter card or use things like Tachibanas and just kind of have enough and pray it works. Or conversely, you can use a board reshuffle like Keji's active skill. You reshuffle the orbs, you get a new set, and then you're going to be fine overall. Like, it's not the most dangerous mechanic, so I would not convert Alphonse to weapon assist unless you have duplicates. Roy Mustang was kind of sad, was pretty sad upon the original debut of the Full Metal Alchemist collab, but he now has significant buffs overall. His active skill is a double orb changer of wood to dark to fire, and then enhanced fire orbs, and then haste on a nine turn cooldown. So in terms of raw value, this is actually quite a high value active skill. It's packing in several different components all in one active on what is actually quite a short nine turn cooldown. So that is definitely advantageous. As a leader, he has been improved significantly, but the problem is Madu is better pretty much in every way, shape, and form because Roy Mustang needs to have two fire combos to tap into his RCV and full damage multiplier, and then you can connect five plus of anything. Connecting five plus of anything is easy. That always can happen from a given board. But the thing is, Madu just does it better. Like, Madu does not need double fire combos to actually occur, so it's just easier to play Madu. You just connect five, you get the damage, you get the damage reduction, you have the RCV anyways. It's not going to be as problematic as Roy Mustang. So because of that, it's hard to really justify using him as a leader that well, because it's not that great, and there are just better things available that are very similar. So we kind of, his awakenings are all right, super awakenings, so, so, whatever. It's his weapon assist that makes him quite tasty. So his weapon assist gives you cloud resist, and he is, will now be the second card after Joyra that can grant you the cloud resist through weapon assist. Cloud resist awakening through weapon assist. And that is a big deal because super awakenings don't take effect in co-op mode. So lots of cards who could gain cloud resist through super awakenings don't help you in co-op. So this can be a huge part. And the thing is, unlike blind orbs, clouds are much harder to deal with. You can't reshuffle the board. You can't active your way through it. You need to resist it or pray the clouds are in such a place that it doesn't affect your combos as much. So cloud resist is become quite powerful. And for myself, if I were to roll one Roy Mustang, I would probably convert him into a Cloud Resist if I did not have my Joyro Weapon Assist. So on Fantastic's account, probably would convert it unless I can just keep piggybacking off my mains Cloud Resist Joyro. So the idea is that it's providing utility that you really don't have any other better counter because Clouds, the best counter is Cloud Resist. There's no other real good counter for it. 
And lastly, we come to King Bradley for the six stars. And King Bradley went from zero to hero, essentially. So his active skill is buffed. It does 150,000 true damage to a single enemy five times, and then plus two combo count for one turn. So the plus two combo count is new. So now it, the secondary effect is, he has an extra effect to it, so it's not as painful as it used to be. His leader skill is change the board to seven by six, and then dark cards get more health, more attack. And then when two, when you get multiple sets of dark, you do more damage. Whoop de do, we don't really care. It's his weapon assist that we only really care about. His weapon assist is what makes King Bradley an amazing card. Because through his weapon assist, you get a time extent, which is a big deal for certain teams, but you also get three poison resists, which is the equivalent to 60% poison resistance. And with 60% poison resistance, you stack it with another friend, you'd have 120%, you resist all poison orbs being generated. And this is one of the best counters possible to a lot of dangerous mechanics. Because the thing is, poison orbs are quite hazardous, especially for teams with high amounts of health, low recovery. And when you can resist those poison orbs, you definitely trivialize many encounters. Something like Seven's Art becomes significantly easier when you're able to resist all his poisons coming out. So. I am very well aware that we do have a very similar weapon assist through the Monster Hunter Club with Raytheon, but the thing is, we don't know when Monster Hunter is going to come back, and arguably King Bradley is a better color. He is dark, and he also provides time extent, something that Raytheon's weapon assist does not. And the dark is important because on things like Dark Metatron teams, it is a big deal. You get the stat transfer, you also get the additional time extent, and with that time extent, you can kind of solve one of Dark Metatron's biggest weak points because Dark Metatron teams tend to have lower amounts of orb movement time. And because of that, you may not hit your seven combos, you don't tap into your damage, you don't get the damage reduction shield. So with King Bradley's weapon assist, you can kind of solve that problem. So you transfer stats, you resist poison, one of the strongest mechanics in the game possible. So this is a very important weapon assist overall, and this is why he's ranked so highly. And if you only have one King Bradley, unless you have a zillion Raytheons floating around, I would in all honesty convert it to his weapon assist because it's just so powerful, especially if you have a dark Metatron team. Now, ignoring all that, let's kind of refocus back on his active skill. So his active skill is 150,000 true damage five times. So if there is a damage absorption or void of like say 200,000 like Sop Debt, you slide underneath and ping her five times. Unfortunately, it's only 750,000 damage. It's not enough to kill Sop Debt from full health, so you're not solving that problem there. Grimjaw and other buttons do more damage, and the only thing that I could really think of is if you're facing a spawn, like multiple spawns of super high amounts of health, as well as super high defense, you can ping each of them down one by one, because once you kill a target, you'll switch and ping another one. So. It's kind of an awkward skill, but at least with the plus two combo count, let's say it caps out on Dark Metatron teams, you get plus two combo count, you pop your other Dark Metatron, you form your VDP three by three box, you're gonna have seven combos, you'd be on your happy little way. And now we come to the five star cards. So unfortunately the five star cards are predominantly lackluster. Their base stats are quite low. Even with limit breaking, it won't be that high and they don't have that many awakenings. So it's just really not worth using them as a sub and they're primarily gonna be used as an inherit which is where most of the focus will be for this review. The first is Winry Lock Rock Bell. And Winry gives an interesting twist. It's 30% heal 30% of your max health healed every turn for four turns, and then 30% damage reduction for four turns. So this healing shielding combination is actually quite powerful, but the biggest drawback is that it's a 14 turn cooldown. So with two Winries, you don't even have 100% uptime, unlike a Kuroyori system, who gives you 40% healing every turn for six turns, I believe, and it's like a seven turn cooldown or something with haste. The point is two Kuroyoris, can't say her name, will loop together. You always have the permanent heal every single turn. Double Winry Rock Bells will not. And the thing is, you don't want to one run Winry as a sub. It doesn't give much whatsoever. So you can inherit on like a one turn cooldown like TARDIS, but even so, it's just not going to be the same. It's nowhere near as efficient. Like in theory, the heal and shield is stronger than flat 40% heal, but if we can't loop it, it's not of value. And that's the main downside of Winry Rock Bell. Maybe in certain situations, you can inherit Winry if you can foresee the need to stall and damage reduction at the same time, but it's going to be a niche active skill overall. 
Next is Riza Hawkeye, and it's kind of like King Bradley, but a little different. It's 40 true damage to a single enemy five times. So same idea, you ping, 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 slide under damage shields. So something like Zeal or Dark Metatron Tamadra, you can slide underneath their damage void, and then you can kill them off right away. Good for efficient farming, can solve some problems. But they also do five turns of Awoken Bind Recovery, and this is on a seven turn cooldown. So for, in terms of pure Awoken Bind Recovery, this is great value and it can help you out. But the problem is Odin Dragon is farmable through monster points, which you can farm and thus acquire. And Odin Dragon is just by default the best Awoken Bind clear in the game for the most part. Gives you a huge heal, gives you Bind Clearing, gives you Awoken Bind Clearing, gives you haste, only a little longer cooldown. He's a great stat stick on most teams. And the only main advantage Riza Hawkeye would have is that she is inheritable. Odin Dragon is not. You can't inherit Odin Dragon. You could inherit Green Odin, but not Odin Dragon. So you, on teams where you don't want to use Odin Dragon, I guess it can be advantageous to inherit Riza Hawkeye, but again, not getting the heal or the extra buying clear in haste does make it less potent overall. May Hughes may feel like a huge waste of magic stones, because he really doesn't do much. He removes Locked Orbs plus one combo count. So it's rare that we need both of those mechanics at the same time, and each mechanic in a vacuum does not do that much. Like, the only real thing I can foresee is that you need to unlock a board, give one combo count, and then you use another board changer afterwards. But the thing is, most high value board changers already do that for you, like Dark Magatron, Yusuke, Blue Sonya, Ryune, they all unlock the board and then convert to a bi color. So you're kind of already accomplished that enough through most high value active skills. So he may be used as a very situational sub on, say, Lu Bei teams for wood row farming for his rows and skill bind resist, but it's really hard to truly justify. He doesn't really do that much, unfortunately. Alex Lewis Armstrong has some sexy poses, got a great mustache, but he really doesn't do much at all. Yes, his active skill is buffed to three turns, but we do we really want to use him as a sub? Probably not. Doesn't do much for the team overall. Like, it's just his stats are too low, he just has health and one seven combo. I don't really think that's going to be accomplishing very much overall. And his active skill does convert all hazards into light orbs. So if you don't have hazards, you don't get the orb conversion. It gives you a chance for enhanced orbs sky falling down. Again, is that that valuable? I really don't foresee myself really using Lu Ar Alex Lewis Armstrong really anywhere because it's rare that we need to remove hazards that regularly. So the thing is, you probably would just use another orb changer anyway. So much more reliable, doesn't have to um, have hazards present to actually work. And then the enhanced skyfalls, Sure, it's kind of nice, but it generally has most value for enhanced heal orbs. But if you wanted wanting enhanced heal orbs, you're probably using something like Mel or EIR to give yourself those orbs falling down almost all the time anyway. So the Skyfall buff is kind of redundant in my opinion, but he's got some great sexy poses. Next is Scar. And Scar has received one of the largest buffs in the Full Metal Alchemist collab. His active skills reduce enemy's defense to zero for three turns. This is new and unique. No other card can reduce it to zero for multiple turns. All defense breaks are only for one turn. And this is important because when you say defense break something, kill it, and then you go to the next floor, it's still active because it carries over on a sweep. But if the subsequent floor has any talking at all whatsoever, it cancels out your defense break. And you're just like, well, that was pointless. They talked to me. They said, hello, welcome to my floor. Bye bye defense break. That's a st that's a really dumb mechanic in my opinion. So with the three turn with the defense break lasting three turns, you can kill a floor, proceed to the next one. They talk. It goes from three down to two turns. Oh look, there's still defense broken, and you can still pierce right through. It can be significant for certain dungeons and compositions, but he also gives a fifty times dark nuke to. Uh, based on your team's dark attack to all enemies. So you can mass attack and button things down quite heavily. But the biggest buff perhaps was that his cooldown was reduced to 15 turns. It was like 24 before or something like that. So now you can inherit Scar on cards with the co-op boost awakening. So let's say even like just say Cerberus Rider or Cerberus Rider Jizz, whatever his name is, he has one co-op boost, two turn cooldown, put Scar on, Big damage, put on like Zarek Infinity, one co-op boost, Vagil, blah, 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 I can't pronounce the name, two skill boosts, inherit on there, oh sorry, two co-op boosts, because the co-op boost will give more attack for the total team, and then you can um, nuke down damage. So this is quite powerful as a button overall, but the thing is, for players who are not interested in button farming, this doesn't do much for them, unfortunately. So it's good for players who like buttoning, but for players who don't care about buttoning, Scar is not going to be as useful. Just remember, you want to try and have as high dark attack as possible, so utilizing co-op boost awakening cards 
is the best way to raise the total dark attack. And then last is Ling Yao. Ling Yao provides you with 100% damage reduction for a single turn. So as long as your buff does not get dispelled, you survive any hit in the game. But the problem is it's for one turn on an 18 turn cooldown and it's just not that high value. You get two times wood dark attack for one turn, but again, it's combining kind of two unusual mechanics in one. Like Nicol Bolas is much better. It's full damage immunity like Ling Yao, but you get two turn haste at least. So you have a nice collateral benefit as well that's significant. So it's really situation where you want to use it. Like for 18 turns, it's almost too long. And in all honesty, if you use something with 75% damage reduction, it's probably enough for you to survive the incoming damage. And things like Indra, like Reincarnate Indra, is a 13 turn cooldown for two turns of shielding. So you have two turns of safety instead of one on a much shorter cooldown. So it's hard to really justify using Ling Yao in my opinion. Now you may think, well, he can get Devil Killer and a Super Awakening Devil Killer, but that's only two Devil Killers and things like Mido come with two already and you can use them in co-op mode without overriding the fact that they have a Super Awakening. Things like Shazelle have three Devil Killers. Like they're just better options available for Devil Killing. So Ling Yao is not really fulfilling much roles or purposes the damage reduction may come in handy in really strange scenarios, so that's why at least it's not a D rank like Louise Armstrong, but again, not that great of a card. So, in conclusion, the Full Metal Alchemist Clap is significantly better than it once was. It is now, I'd say, one of the better five stone seasonal slash collab events we do have, just because all of the six star cards have value through their weapon assist forms or even just as subs or leaders. So, there is value there. Some of the five stars are great, but the thing is, a lot of it is middling. So, it all really depends, like how much do you love the franchise, how much do you love the cards, do you really want the six star cards, because if you don't really care about all that stuff that much, it may be best to just simply monster exchange for Edward and just kind of ignore all the rest, save yourself a bunch of magic stones, use them in higher value events. Like for instance, let's say you did want Edward but didn't want anything else, roll in the seasonal godfest, get those godfest exclusives, exchange for Edward, you probably came out ahead in terms of magic stones because Edward only has a 2.5% chance of being rolled. I don't know how lucky you are, but those are not the best odds overall. So let me know what you think about the Full Metal Alchemist collab in the comments below. Hopefully you all have a fantastic day. I wish you all the best of luck in your own pad adventures, and happy puzzling.